social media algorithm, dating apps, virtual assistants, all of these data-driven applications have been powered by artificial intelligence for several years. But the power of AI has been mostly invisible to everyday consumers. It's been really interesting to see generative AI start booming. AI has been around in the data and analytics space for a long time. A lot of the AI that's used in analytics is really focused just on simple coding, it's kind of traditional data science, but it, it helps us essentially solve problems quicker. This is Campaign US bite-sized AI for Marketers series. I'm Freddie McLaughlin, sharing how she amplifies data analysis with artificial intelligence. So we use a software platform called Redbird, and essentially what that does is it uses coding and other data connections to auto-populate reports when we get fresh data. So a lot of our clients, we do monthly reporting or we do quarterly reporting, and it takes a lot of time for a person to go in and populate the data on 20 to 30 slides, sometimes upwards of 60 slides of data. Redbird is an analytic software that collects organizations' data sources and automates data reporting, analysis, and other data science tasks making data insights accessible to those with no prior coding experience. It can even help us with some of the text generation, which is really cool. So then what we can do as an analyst team is go in afterwards and really apply some thinking, really apply some, some deep strategy to what we're seeing in the data as opposed to previously where it would take forever, we'd be up against a deadline. Really unlocked our ability to get deeper into the data and find more meaning from it. Artificial intelligence can also analyze creative assets in large volumes, allowing marketers to truly decipher what is resonating with consumers. It focuses on the bigger picture, where humans tend to look at individual cases. Some of the APIs that Google actually has, and one that we've leveraged and built a pretty cool tool from, and what they do is they take any captcha that you would look at from an image across Google or anywhere like that where you have to do the security images, they're constantly training their models to pick out what is present in a video, in a piece of text. So what this technology can do is really go in and look at some of the emotions that a person might have, it can go in and look at objects. Obviously, there's a person here. It's also showing a packaged good because she's holding the bottle of Astapro. There are some labels it pulls in, and then it gives you a confidence interval for everything. So when we're looking at this data at a more aggregate level, we can just set a minimum here, a minimum threshold, to say that anything over, let's say, 70% confidence, we could say, or we feel comfortable saying that it should be in the video. I think what's interesting is most of this is actually coming through correctly here. Sometimes it looks a little weird or a little off. Looks like it must be getting better. They also can pull out text, which is pretty crazy because it says Astapro here, and that's the brand name that's on the bottle, but you can barely see that in this image. It also gives us some different color gradients to look at, and we see what kind of colors are popping for people. Is it enables us to make content recommendations. AI can similarly analyze large volumes of content to instantly unlock new insights on trends. Let's say we had a thousand videos. Someone would have to go in and watch a thousand videos and say, this video had someone smiling in it, this video had a certain product in it, or like this video, let's say, had a fruit in it. You would have to go in and watch a thousand videos. What this technology can do now is we'll basically watch all of those videos for us. It gives us attributes to those videos. So then what we can do is look at scale to see how much these attributes are showing up in content. It gives us a much better idea of the types of content that are resonating with people because we can also overlay performance and behavioral data into this new video tagging data. About half of the videos that we looked at for this contained a person, but those videos were performing 13% worse than videos that didn't contain people, which we thought was super weird because it was a kid's brand. They were trying to like have fun and engaging social content. So why was it not working? But then what we found was interesting is that 41% of the videos had a person, but only 10% had someone that was smiling. 
less than 10% had someone that was overtly displaying happiness, and then only 2% had someone that contained laughter. So they had people in their ads, but they weren't happy. And like you can see it from this kid's expression here, and this was one where I went in and I tested the algorithm because I was like, maybe it's just getting it wrong. It's not understanding it. And I watched a decent number of videos and I was like, wow, this is like, uh, this is accurate. Like these people just aren't happy in these ads and that's why they're not doing as well. So we're able to say that the recommendation then would be, uh, which it, you shouldn't have to say, but it's make happy people in your videos basically. McLaughlin believes that the generative AI boom has made conversations with clients easier. With their exposure to the technology rising, executives tend to be more open-minded about implementing it. We also are very transparent with our clients, with our internal stakeholders, that what we're seeing is directional. Obviously, there are going to be one-off cases that are different, but I think that's the case for really any analysis is that it, any number that you get is never going to be perfect, but at least directionally, it can help us start moving in the right direction where, if, is it gonna be correct 10 times out of 10? No, but if it's still correct eight or nine times out of 10, that's still pretty good. But when it comes to using publicly available but privately owned AI tools like ChatGPT, agencies are cautious of sharing proprietary client data with these tools. Instead, they're creating their own in-house applications that leverage the power of existing tools in secure environments. What's tough for us is we have a lot of healthcare clients, so we can and don't want to put any of their data into ChatGPT, but what we can do is use extensions from that to build in-house tools that are fully contained in our secure ecosystem to be able to look at topic modeling from surveys, or even if we're looking at a whole bunch of news articles from somewhere, we can use AI and use the same technology that goes into ChatGPT, but we can use that to analyze article sentiment, article tone. Previously, it's something where we would have to have a person go in and manually do all of that. Regardless of the power AI brings to the hands of marketers, human creativity remains essential. It, it takes away the elements that are the most time consuming and mentally difficult for people, which a lot of times is just getting started. And it takes from that zero to actually doing something. Sometimes that might be 80% of your time, just trying to figure that out where AI makes that 10% of your time. So then you can spend so much more time thinking, coming up with better ideas, coming up with more creative survey ideas. When it comes to creating a lot of tools and using AI, it's really a lot of coding. We have a great data scientist team here that they're able to go in and create a lot of these tools from scratch. It's connecting to existing APIs, sometimes creating some of our own unique code on top of that and bringing it into one system that's able to perform a lot of these analyses and leverage existing AI, either technologies or APIs that are out there. In the next episode, we'll explore how generative AI is reshaping the jobs of creatives.